Maybe you've got the intelligence and the guts to use it. That's what we were telling them in work, by, by slogans of this kind. Now came the war. Within a matter of days, after the ratification conference in Indianapolis, the over-the-road bosses west of the Mississippi began to back off from the contract. They participated in the negotiations, had indicated formal ratification there, and the focal point became Omaha, Nebraska, where all the trucking lines locked out the men. The strike spread from there to Des Moines, to Sioux City, and, and uh, other, uh, other towns in the general area, but the focal point was Omaha. And there's where we joined battle. Now just let me note in passing that we had no sooner gotten engaged in this battle, which became quite a battle out in the West, than the trucking bosses here in the East began to violate the contract, and they began to try to make good on the expectations they had that they had a good class collaborationist deal, and no matter what the contract said, if when the business agent come to see him, they said, well, geez, you look kind of seedy. Don't you think you ought to have a new suit or a new porcelini hat? That, well, he forgot the grievance. Well, this went on while the battle was going on. I just wanted to make a note of it in passing because we're going to come back to that later, too. Omaha was the key point, and on top of everything else, the state of Nebraska had an, an anti-picketing law. The town of Omaha was under the tight control of a central boss's organization that was the counterpart of the Citizens Alliance I described to you in Minneapolis. It was run by the Union Pacific Railroad. I guess that tells you everything, doesn't it? Well, we laid siege to Omaha like Grant laid siege to Vicksburg. And we captured Omaha like Grant captured Vicksburg. Within the town, we defied the anti-picketing law. There were injunctions, oh, they got injunctions out against us by the dozen. I never mentioned that the judges passed out injunction, injunctions every day just like the bosses were taking aspirin during the strike in, in Minneapolis. But all an injunction is is a piece of paper that gives a pseudo-legal justification for a cop trying to part your ears with a club. And when he's already doing that, you're mobilized to fight that. Well, you care about this piece of paper. Well, we didn't have quite that situation in Omaha, so we used the other device, one that one was developed and magnificently practiced by the Wobblies in the great free speech fights. You just bet the judge his jail isn't big enough to enforce the injunction. That's the way you do it. And on three separate occasions in that strike that went from September of 1938 to February of 1934, we had virtually the whole membership of the Omaha Truck Drivers Union in jail at one time. And it was untenable for any time we defied the, the anti-picketing law, we did it as a block, as a block, hundreds and hundreds strong. They'd toss the, toss the membership in the pokey, and they'd come around, you know, with that tin plate with a little that slum gullion on it, and a hot tin thing that had something they called coffee that was left over from fumigating the cockroaches in the, in the warden's office. And the truck drivers would take this and they'd throw the slum on the floor and they'd start a tattoo on the cells with the plates and the cups, you know. You could hear it all over downtown Omaha, you know. It just became one town. <laughs> meantime, meantime, we closed in by using the power of the other terminals until we got them narrowed down. The one last chance they had was in, uh, I'm not too far over time yet, am I? Uh, the last chance they had to break through in a serious way was in Omaha, and in Kansas City. So we called a conference of all the key figures in Omaha and the contiguous terminals to Kansas City. And you know, you get a bunch of over-the-road truck drivers together, and there's not much that goes on in the industry, legal and illegal, that they don't know about. We had this council of war, and, and we found every trick, every possible device the bosses could use to smuggle freight in and out through Kansas City to keep alive in Omaha while we had them strangled in other ways. And we got all the facts. We made a little map. Got one of these unmarked uh, county maps of the state that you can get if you go to the state highway department. And we marked it up 
with all kinds of symbols and lines and so on, all had real meaning to show exactly how we could lick the whole situation in the Missouri Valley if we clamped down on Omaha. We got a committee together and we went down and saw Tobin about it and asked his help. And he was impressed. He looks at this map and that did it. He says, geez, just like a general. <laughs> <laughs> So he told us, <laughs> told us, all right, I'll back you. You go out there and I'll you lay down the law to these Kansas City bosses. Don't strike them unless you have to. But if you have to strike them, I'll back you and I'll pay strike benefits. Now, formally, then, the, uh, the, uh, as they still do, the Teamsters Union paid strike benefits. But uh, Tobin had it fixed up in the Constitution and bylaws, like these insurance policies you get, you know, as a bonus when you buy a... Uh, a year's subscription to a newspaper. You've got to have a certain color necktie on, and you've got to be walking with the wind, not against the wind, when you get hit by a car crossing the street, or the policy's not good. And Tobin had the strike benefits set this way. So I told us, now, whatever you do, you go out there and you, he says, you know, you've got to follow the law. Well, I'll just make it short. It reminded me of a, of a friendly vessel in wartime be given a chart to come in through the minefield into port without, without getting blown up on the way in. <laughs> he showed us exactly how we could work our way through all the clauses. We go out to Kansas City and we call all the bosses in. They come in. Oh, boy, were they cocky. They thought they had us because in, uh, in uh, Kansas City and in St. Louis, two of the key terminals in Missouri were two of the figures among the old feudal barons that were dead against this thing, and they wanted no part of it because each of them had a little principality carved out. He had a nice little setup for himself in which he run everything with, a, with an iron hand, and the head of the, uh, the, head of the Teamsters set up in, uh, in Kansas City at that time was also a political lieutenant of what's the name of the joker that uh, was the political czar there for so long, Pendergast. The guy had put all the concrete all over Kansas City in order to get a little uh, cut. Uh, they were dead against this whole thing, and they were, they were egging the bosses on to fight us. The bosses thought they really had something. They were cocky. We walk into the meeting, and there's bosses there from everywhere. Arkansas, Louisiana, Texas, Kentucky, Tennessee, southern Missouri, Oklahoma, Kansas, Colorado, New Mexico, just that whole area. Anybody thought he might get touched the way this steamroller was, was uh, going down the road. And they said we... We'll do so and so and so and so and so, which was practically nothing. You can take it or leave it. So we said, well, we'll have to let us consult a minute. So we don't want to just give a yes or no answer to, uh, to your proposition for a settlement. We're following out Tobin's plan to get through the minefield. So this is about 10 o'clock in the morning. We say, can we have, say, till 4 o'clock in the afternoon? And... Uh, we go out of the room, go right to a phone in our room in the hotel, call Tobin. Bosses refuse to sign. Don't do a thing now, he says. You'll get a wire from me. He says, I'll call the rest of the general executive board, and I'll wire you a ratification. Oh, well, we told him we've given the bosses at 4 o'clock before we give the answer. Good, I'll have the wire to the air before that. Sure enough, about 3 o'clock, we get a wire from Daniel J. Tobin authorizing a strike of all the over-the-road trucking concerns operating in and out of Kansas City, with full strike benefits. We come in at 4 o'clock, bosses are there, cocky, you know. We sit down in front of them. We don't say a word. We just flip the telegram across <laughs> the table. So they asked for a caucus. <laughs> they were out about 15 minutes. They come back in with a subcommittee of six. Said, we want to meet a subcommittee of yours. We want to sit down around the clock negotiations, and we guarantee you that the negotiations won't, won't end even in a recess for sleep until we've had a settlement and we'll give you a fair settlement. And they gave us a fair settlement. They gave us what we wanted. This closed Omaha end of the point where finally the Omaha bosses capitulated. And with this, we brought everything to a new stage. We had fought the major war. We'd beaten out all the opposition in every respect. And we had proven that we could back up everything we had said we were going to do if the contract hadn't been signed here in the merchandise mart in the first place. And then we demonstrated the Eastern bosses that there was such a thing as retroactivity. 
We picked one of the biggest operators in the East. He runs out of Detroit, and he runs all the way from New York City to Oklahoma City, fanning out in all directions. And we'd had a, we'd had a special detachment keeping a record on him while we're fighting out in the Missouri Valley. We had all the grievances, amounted to thousands of dollars in money he owed the drivers. We said, in a, first we give him the demands. He laughed. He thought this is funny as hell. We set a deadline. Right at a peak period in over-the-road trucking, prearranged signal, and at that hour, just all of a sudden, every wheelie had stopped between New York City and Oklahoma City, and they didn't turn again until we got the final report from the final business agent of the final local that every worker in that terminal received in his hand a check for the full settlement on the money the boss had cheated him out of by chiseling on the contract. And this demonstrated that it wasn't any class collaboration deal. And you can imagine what it did for the, for the morale of the, uh, of the truck drivers. In the course of the fight, a body of, uh, of uh, truck drivers out in the Sioux City area got framed up by the FBI. They claim that these drivers picketing out on the highway had rolled a truck over. And so help me. The Federal Bureau of Investigation sent a big surveying detachment out and went through a long process of surveying, studying the legal maps and everything in order to make a case to prove that the truck had been stopped on the Iowa side of the line and rolled over onto the Minnesota side of the line, which made an interstate commerce and gave the federal government jurisdiction. They brought these men to trial under the Mann Act now, the Mann Act is for stealing vehicles. And, uh, or no, not the Mann Act, no. <laughs> uh, the Dyer Act, the Dyer Act. <laughs> Once in a while we had a truck driver, you know, had a grievance over the Mann Act, need a little legal help. <laughs> the Dyer Act, you know, for, for stealing a vehicle and transporting it across state lines. Now, one of the significant things is that the whole area from Michigan across to Colorado and from Minnesota and North Dakota down into Oklahoma and Arkansas and Texas. Local after local stood in absolute solidarity with those men. And when they were convicted and the judge tried to, tried to uh, order them sent to the state penitentiary that very night if we didn't make, make $15,000 in cash bond for them, all over the area, the local secretary treasurer just went out and dipped into the treasury and started wiring money into Sioux City. And just before the deadline, uh, we were able to walk over to the federal clerk and lay 15,000 iron men on the line and take these workers out of the county jail and save them from being in the federal penitentiary the next morning. Fought the thing, appealed it. In the end, it stuck, and they had to do a two-year hitch in the penitentiary. But it, it's a little... A little sidelight that gives you some feeling of the kind of battles that went on in that period and the kind of solidarity that can be generated on a far wider, more amorphous area now dealing with this, with this whole 11 state area that I, I'm speaking of than was the case in, in Minneapolis. Now we consolidated then the over the road organization with the renewal of the contract a year later in the late summer, early fall of 1939, in which another big improvement was made in conditions. We tightened up all the way up and down the line on the contract from the point of view of the concepts of union control on the job, and arrived at a definitive stage in the development of the over-the-road structure and its imposition on the bosses under union control and under union power with the unqualified right to strike that represented the definitive shattering of the old craft union structure of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters and that opened the way to the growth to the present stage and potential power of the Teamsters Union. We weren't able to carry on from there. We had to leave it at that point because something else was happening. While we were consolidating the over-the-road victory and 
preparing a tightly knit setup, World War II started. Hitler invaded Poland, and Roosevelt, who had made his quarantine the aggressor speech in 1938, began preparing for American intervention in the Second World War. At the same time, the radicalization was ebbing because it had not passed beyond the union level to the political level, and the price is already being paid, even though there were, was a recession in 1939 that was closely comparable in its depths to the recession the, in, the, in the earlier part of the 30s. The bureaucracies were becoming re-entrenched in the unions a new form now with the rise of the CIO, and these trends signaled a reversal of the favorable objective conditions that had operated to our benefit in the earlier 30s. And this led soon to a new controversy with Tobin and the question of war policy was at the heart of the controversy. Tobin was already then, in 1939, playing the role of a bellwether for Roosevelt. You know what a bellwether is? That, what they call them in the stockyards, the Judas goat, you know, that leads the other animals up the ramp to the slaughtering pen, and then he goes on by, and the other animals go in and become roasts and chops and one thing or another. Tobin was playing the role of the bellwether to help dra dragoon the workers into the ranks of the imperialist army for World War II. He was writing editorials in the journal, militant editorials calling for the United States to get into the war against Hitler, and beginning to seek to impose this line on the Union. We sought to avoid any unnecessary friction with Tobin in this regard, but there could be no compromise on the fundamental questions of principle involved. And in this situation, the reversal of the objective trends was beginning to embolden the reactionaries and the opportunists throughout the Union, including the Teamsters Union, and it was even having certain effects in Local 574, particularly among people who had come into the Union after the strike battles and who were more reaping the benefits of the struggle that had been fought than being contributing members to everything that had been created. And in Local 574, Long well into 1940, they set up a phony committee of 100 inside the Union, bowdlerizing, desecrating, if I may use the expression to call it by a more appropriate name, crapping on that magnificent body of 100 fighters that had been the broad general staff of the strikes in 1934 that I described to you last night, trying to make capital out of this concept for an utterly reactionary purpose. They were helped and encouraged in this by the FBI, which had been keeping dossiers on the leaders and the main militants in 574 and was feeding information to these finks and phonies of a red, uh, you know, material for red-baiting attacks that they could use inside the Union. And the local AFL bureaucrats were getting into the act until it came to the point that Tobin decided he had to do something. Now, I mean, he decided he had to do something. I think you can understand why Tobin wasn't exactly spoiling to get into another fight with us. We'd had quite a few brushes. And he hadn't done any too good. He didn't want another showdown fight with Local 544 if he could avoid it. He didn't want it. He wanted to avoid it. 
For one thing, he was uncertain as to how deeply the International Brotherhood of Teamsters as a whole would be affected, because we weren't without some support and following throughout the Teamsters Union, particularly after this two-year struggle for the establishment of the over-the-road setup. But nevertheless, Tobin was prepared to subordinate the union considerations to his collaboration with Roosevelt. He began by making overtures for a compromise arrangement with the leadership of 544. He proposed to establish what you might have termed in the light of its opening conception of a benevolent receivership. A receivership, as you know, in a union is a device used by the international unions to send a representative in to take charge of the local and abrogate all democratic powers of decision in the local and arrogate to the receiver, who is the representative of the general president of the international and takes orders only from him, all powers of decision. What Tobin proposed was a receivership in which the local would be given a maximum of leeway, but we would have to accept a receiver who would have the power of veto if we insisted on doing something that the international felt couldn't be tolerated. And of course, the whole thing hinged on the war question. Now, we couldn't accept any such arrangement because it would have meant the gradual strangulation of all local autonomy. It would, have, it would have marked the beginning of the imposition of a tight dictatorship over the Union. The party cadre in the Union would have become compromised. It would have become disoriented. The whole party would have suffered losses. The whole party would have suffered discreditment because in the end we would have been perforce playing fast and loose with principles on that most vital of all questions, war. We had no alternative but to fight. Tomorrow night we'll go into that battle. <clears throat> Take a five minute at uh, Mr. Dobbs will answer questions. Uh, yes, you stated that uh, Roosevelt is that the objective situation changed along about 1939 because the uh, upsurge among the workers hadn't, uh, hadn't uh, went on and into his next lot and developed into, a, into the political level and it's been political action. Uh, tell me, what uh, do you see any? Any, uh, how do you think the, you think there's a possibility of a repetition of that in the civil rights movement today? What do you think of the change in the civil rights movement won't go on to the level of independent political action? Uh, what do you think the change is going to be? Well, uh, tomorrow night, after I describe the fight in 1941, I plan to terminate by dealing briefly with the labor upsurge of 1943-46 and then coming back to take a brief, somewhat different look at the day from the point of view of the little excursion we've been making into the past here that I had hoped might throw some new light on some of the factors. And in that, I will try to deal briefly with the interrelation between the civil rights movement and the labor movement at the present conjuncture, not in primary terms of the civil rights movement, because we're, what we're talking about here is the struggle potential of the working class, but primarily from the point of view of the impact that the civil rights movement is bound to have on the labor movement. One of the factors I will mention in that connection will be what the, what the uh, role of the civil rights movement will be in, I believe, inevitably bringing about the breakup of the labor democratic coalition. And 
I believe the reason will be because there is not the room for an adaptation uh, of long duration of the civil rights movement to the capitalist two-party system that has been the case with the labor movement. Not because there aren't some leadership problems in the civil rights movement that are broadly analogous to some of the leadership problems of the labor movement today, but for other reasons. Uh, today, as is being very richly demonstrated right now at the Democratic Party convention, it is crystal clear that a very significant sector of the leadership of the civil rights movement, composed in part of the more conservative leaders who, as a matter of fact, in their own way are as afraid of the mass actions that the Negro people are developing today as the bureaucrats are of mass action by the workers and want to keep the thing tied to the present political structure. And what they really want, in, in my estimation, is something substantial right here and now for the talented tenth and a f promises that can be a little more delivered in their fulfillment for the mass of the Negro people, and militant leaders that cannot be defined as conservative in this sense, but who yet feel they must adapt themselves to the two-party political structure of the capitalist system because their own development hasn't reached the point of consciousness where they recognize the vital necessity of independent political action by the civil rights movement because there are as yet no vehicles at hand because in a sense the civil rights movement is for the moment in a stage you might say in this sense is somewhat akin to what the problem was of bringing the atomized working class of the 30s first to the level of union organization before it would be prepared to pass on to political organization in the sense that although there were existing organizations, the NAACP and the Corps and others, that what is happening is that new formations are coming into being manifesting the need to forge new broad mass instruments of struggle even just at the level of mass action, demonstrations, picketing, sit-ins, and so on, uh, that flow from that qualitative difference that the civil rights struggle at its present stage of development is breaking through not only the concepts of tokenism and gradualism and demanding freedom now, but is breaking through the concept of the masses being a cheering section for the white liberals in the, in the two parties of the capitalist system and other so-called friends of the civil rights movement who always got a reason why you can't do very much right now and really want to trick and entrap the Negro people back into the old pattern of tokenism and gradualism. Why, consider, for instance, I happened to find a copy of the New York Times this morning. It carries just a little bit more, more news than your papers. And uh, uh, I noticed one story there. A reporter's describing one of the white liberals at the convention lecturing the candidates of the Freedom Democratic Party from Mississippi that they're hurting the cause by barging in and sitting in the seats that are reserved for the white cracker delegation from Mississippi they're refusing to take them, that this hurts the cause. You, you, you begin to wonder how, uh, how stupid can you get? Uh, what kind of a friend is that? That kind of friend, you know, the Negro people don't need any enemies. Uh, in this kind of a situation, the, the militants are not yet to a point objectively in any substantial numbers where they see clearly the need 
for independent political action. It's manifested in another sense in the experience of the Freedom Now Party up to now. That, uh, that declaration uh, uh, issued under the initiative of William Worthy of the Afro-American and others at the time of the March on Washington calling for the Freedom Now Party uh, was a magnificent document that told very fundamental political truths. But it hasn't yet got too broad a response throughout the civil rights movement. Uh, the, the main forms of manifestation, as I believe you're all generally aware, is the development of the Freedom Now Party in Michigan, where they're running a slate in the local elections, and the, and the running of a candidate for uh, state senate in New York uh, uh, from Harlem uh, by the uh, Freedom Now uh, Party chapter there. But beyond that, the, the whole pattern of this stage is to go along with the idea of support to the Democratic Party and playing faction politics in the Democratic Party. Now, in that sense, you could say there remains a direct equation between the general run of the leadership of the civil rights movement and the general run of the officialdom of the union movement in practicing Democratic Party politics. And I would add that among the conservative strata of the Negro leaders, uh, there is no doubt a desire to keep it that way just as much as the union bureaucrats would like. Now, one of the reasons that the union bureaucrats have been able to keep things that way is that the artificial prosperity of a war economy, a little two-bit concession here and there alongside of 75 cents worth of concessions being taken back by the bosses, with the, with the treachery of the union officialdom, the imposing of ever harsher anti-labor laws that increase government regimentation of the unions and give, and give handles to the union bureaucrats, it has been possible to contain the rank and file of the labor movement within this situation. Tomorrow night I'll speak a little about some of the factors I believe are operating that are going to change that. But this possibility is not present in the case of the civil rights struggle. Uh, concessions, or shall I say mollifications, of the working class can, can be maintained so long as a worker finds it possible to get by, feels he's going to hold his own, maybe sometime things will get a little better and he can do something before they tend to radicalize. And some more blows are going to have to be struck at the workers, and as I'll try to show tomorrow night, they're going to be struck that will feed this process. But in the case of the Negro people, the fight is for freedom now, for full, complete, unqualified social, political, and economic equality right here and now, no questions asked, no holes barred, not tomorrow, today. To give that the capitalist class must give away one of the most vital instruments it's got in keeping the working class separated. And herein, as I, remar as I observed just in passing in my, in my opening remarks, the first night is one of the great treacheries of the union bureaucracy today, that they're permitting the white supremacists to split the working class. The capitalists can't do that. That's the, that's the key significance, in my opinion, of Goldwaterism. Goldwaterism is, before everything else, racism. A play on prejudice against Negroes among whites. And it's making a bid for a labor vote, among other things in the process. Capitalism can't grant the demands of the Negro people. So the alternatives are either that the Negro people would have to fall back and say, well, we'll take it on the slow bell for another hundred years, or they're going to have to break with the capitalist political structure. Now, if I may, uh, may uh, use a syllogism, since I don't think they're about to agree to another hundred years of tokenism and gradualism, is the Greeks would say, ergo, they're on the way to a break with the capitalist two-party system. I think that's the difference. There is not the Lebensraum. In other words, right here and now today, with respect to the civil rights struggle, 
to live within the capitalist two-party system that remains with respect to the white working class. <coughs> well, the thing is, do you, do you think it's possible that in America, for example, the civil rights movement and the labor movement will come together as one working body? If so, do you think that it will be a long time or will it be immediate? I mean, not to immediate, but in the near future. Well, here again, here again, we're, we're touching on a point that uh, I plan to deal with tomorrow night. And uh, there's one more objective fact about the history of the working class that I want to get into the record of the discussion before we come to this assessment. And that is what was demonstrated by the 1943-1946 uh, uh, labor upsurge. Uh, but for now, I will say, yes, I think it is, uh, it is inevitable that the Negro struggle will play a big role in radicalizing the working class as a whole. I think it is inevitable that in a radicalized working class, the Negro workers will play a key role because the Negro worker today, and now when I speak of Negro worker, I speak of it in the dual sense of Negro workers and labor movement and the fact that the overwhelming majority of the Negro people are of the working class. Uh, in in uh, uh, today, the Negro worker in the civil rights struggle is getting some education in a different setting, in the concepts of mass action, the strategic and tactical problems of mass action, the deep political lessons that are that are driven home by mass action when you're up when you're up against uh, uh, the ruling class which is a ruling class, is, in addition to being a white ruling class, is also a ruling class vis-a-vis -vis the Negro people just as much as it's, it's a ruling class vis-a-vis -vis the working class as a whole. And the key to this, I think, and this is the main thing I want to touch briefly on tomorrow night, is the effect that the dual role of the Negro will be. The dual role in the sense he is part of an embattled people waging a civil rights struggle for freedom and equality here and now and as a part of the working class who is carrying that struggle right into the union movement as a part of the civil rights battle and in the course of it beginning to fight already a fight for a lot of white workers that unfortunately Primarily due to the bureaucrats, not too many white workers are yet aware of. Tomorrow night, I want to I want to touch on that side of the thing. But as I say, before I go all the way into it, as far as time permits, I want to get in one final piece of evidence about the revolutionary potential of the American working class in terms of the 1943-46 upsurge. Any more questions? I didn't hear it. Paul Jacobs uh, wrote, Paul Jacobs wrote a book called The State of Eden. And uh, on the last part, he has a postscript there. And he goes on, uh, obviously he was close to the Trotskyist the SWD at one time. But uh, in his uh, postscript, he characterizes the state of the unions now, the state of the mentality of the American workers as being essentially that of the middle class, you know. They're inert, they're, they're passive, they're non-political, they're uninterested, they don't give a damn. And he concludes all this by saying, uh, labor, labor bureaucracy has created a, a uh, working class that really thinks like the middle class. Uh, this hit me as weird because I, I don't see how the labor, uh, how uh, the working class could ever possibly think like the like the middle class. 
classes be characterized like the middle class. They might have a few attitudes, but he, he goes on to say that, uh, well, he doesn't say this uh, outwardly, but he, he says that they're essentially, they essentially think like the middle class. Now, do you think this is a, a proper characterization? No. <laughs> Any mathematics students here? Must be a programmer or something. You had to study some kind of mathematics. Yeah, the, term, the term is extrapolation, isn't it? Uh, I'll let them give you a college definition of extrapolation. But that's the concept. He has extrapolated his narrow, warped perception and conception of class forces and the dynamics of class struggle in this country from his own limited mind gratuitously into the minds, the social being of the working class. He has described what uh, he thinks the working class is today because he's taken a very superficial look. If you recall, I started by saying that if you have to examine what the working class really is from the point of view of what you see today, there's a lot of odds against you. But if you go back as we have done and look into the past a little, you find that there is much more there than meets the eye today. Now, it's true, Jacobs knew a little something about that. But uh, some people have a capacity, you know, to go through a thing or to witness a thing and maybe have a ringside seat. If memory serves me right, he did drop into Minneapolis once or twice during that period and yet not really understand what is going on. And that, that is Jacobs' problem. Um, he echoes, really, the uh, thinking of the bureaucrats. I notice, and it's not only Jacobs, <clears throat> it's others that are pontific in one, pontificating in one way or another about the labor movement today. One of the things I notice is that they they give evidence that they did their research in the offices mainly of union bureaucrats and they're citing mainly what the union bureaucrats got to say about the situation. I would be much more impressed and would give much more serious consideration to the point of view where maybe a man has detected something that maybe slows down the process a little, not basically would change it, if he would demonstrate that he had spent a lot of time talking to workers on production lines, down in coal mines, on trucks, working behind counters in cafeterias. In short, in short, if he had had a real consultation with the great rank and file, I would be much more impressed. But <clears throat> he really, he really echoes what the union bureaucrats are saying. What is Ruther saying today? Uh, he doesn't put it quite in those words yet, generally, but, uh, but uh, he is arguing the classless society. A guy who has done pretty well and has forgotten he got the hell beat out of him on the overpass at Ford's back in the 30s. Or I guess he figures the bosses have changed. What's changed is that Ruther got on the gravy train, and he likes it. Uh, Ruther speaks of the middle-class aspirations of the workers. A part of this is brainwashing. Uh, this is what Madison Avenue tries to do day in and day out. What is the image that Madison Avenue is trying to create today? That the be-all and the end-all for life today, something that every individual citizen is dedicated to, is to get a bathtub with gold knobs and, and a limousine with a bar built in to the back seat 
in a ranch-type dwelling with three swimming pools, that the whole thing is status, grabbing some material thing and in a rat race to do a little better than Jones next door, and that it's a good life to put yourself in a hock up to your ears. What's one of the things that helps make the workers conservative today? Why, they owe everybody from the, from the uh, Treasury Department of the United States for the salary they're collecting this year, down through the mortgage company or the landlord, the people that sell the furniture, sell the automobiles, and everything. everything they got, they got principally and primarily on credit. They're living today on what's got to be paid tomorrow. And what is called a petty bourgeois aspiration, uh, aspiration sometimes, it isn't that at all. It's just the natural aspiration of people to have a decent life. The natural yearning of parents to make it possible for their kids to have a better situation than they have. They'll break their back and sacrifice no end to put their kids through school hoping and feeling that the more education the child can get, the better chance the child will have to do better in life. In Madison Avenue, as the, as the supreme manifestation of the propaganda mechanism of American imperialism that closely rivals Washington, in proving to be the real walking living image of what Orwell conceived in his book 1984, Double Speak. They drill into the people all the time. This is what you are, this is what you believe in, things are the way they are because that's the way you want them, and all you need to do to make them better is to buy this particular brand of tranquilizers or that particular brand of whiskey that will impress the boss when he comes to the house and so on in order to have a better life. And they say this is the mentality of the working class. And all it, all it is is a distorted, bottlerized, deceitful, tricking, lying Image is a lie, whether the person that tells a lie tells it consciously or not. Image of what the working class is because it's caught in what it is, and as yet it don't know how to do anything about it. And these pontificators, these historians, these researchers, who are about as profound as Gunther, who would make a quick trip to a country and write inside Asia or inside Africa or inside the loose publications or what have you, it's got just about as much meaning. No, I don't believe it. Anything else? Bob, do you have a question? Peter. Uh, in uh, the late 40s, and since that time, we've had a couple of labor laws which have put a pretty big crimp in the ability of labor to... Uh, to uh, organize further and, or, and even to keep what it is want. Uh, namely the Taft Hartley Law first and then the Land of Griffith Kennedy Bill. Could you say some of the, uh, describe some of the major, you know the laws are very complex, but some of the major differences between what you could do at that time in the 30s of organizing the labor movement and what Laws, what kind of obstacles these laws constitute today. Uh, for example, one thing occurred to me when you spoke of uh, the ability of, of some of the terminals, the main terminals, like in Chicago, elsewhere, to affect what went on, the way the paid conditions uh, provided in other terminals. Today, isn't, isn't that known as secondary boycott? That is where you strike in one one company or one area in order to win a concession in another area or even in another industry or another company. Could you go into some of the, the differences of the labor movement in the day legally uh, against yeah. the government uh, 
from? Yes. Uh, I'll try to make some generalizations about it. Uh, it is true that the taft hartley law, the Landrum-Griffin law, are viciously anti-labor laws that impose certain formal restrictions on the unions that weren't imposed in such laws as were enacted, such as the NIRA and the Wagner Act back in the 30s. That is, they represent a taking and the, uh, and the uh, Landrum Griffin Act had, such as the secondary boycott thing, that would have made a problem with regard to using the union power to reach out terminal to terminal. That's true. But that's only one of some other and greater truths that are involved in this situation. A second truth is that unlike the leaders that built the union movement as it is today out of the struggles of the 30s, and I mean all the struggles, the Minneapolis, San Francisco, Toledo, the CIO battles, everything. These people are not leaders, they're labor lawyers. They don't think in struggle terms. They go around, they got, yeah, well, look at these business agents today. They all got a briefcase. What's in the briefcase? A copy of all the laws. A list of the precedent decisions made by the National Labor Relations Board. And a worker comes in. I have the slogan I told you we give the over-the-road drivers. You can do anything you're big enough to do. A worker comes into the business agent of the grievance or a proposal of what the union ought to try. He gets his briefcase out and starts reading the law. See whether or not you can do it. The mentality of the leader. Whereas the real fighters, as I say, used to tear up injunctions and bet the judge's jail wasn't big enough. Others yet another factor. Prior to the Wagner Act, all that existed when we had the main battles that came before the Wagner Act, what existed was the law of the jungle in legal terms and all on the boss's side. All on the boss's side. Uh, everything that is proscribed today by law was proscribed in fact then by the device of the labor injunction and, and the utilization of police power ranging all the way from the city cops to the federal army, depending on the magnitude of the struggle. And it, it embraced and went beyond uh, in its full details, just as the real meaning of anti-labor policy and government does today, what's formally proscribed in the Taft-Hartley and Landrum-Griffin law. Now let me cite yet another truth. A law is not an act of God. It is not a natural phenomenon. It is not cast down by Zeus in lightning from Olympus. It is not unchangeable. A law in the last analysis is an attempt at a codification at that moment of the relationship of forces between contending classes in which the ruling class defines both the latitude it has to give to the rule and the limitations that it imposes upon the democratic rights of the rule. That's all a law is. And a law is as effective or as ineffective in the last analysis as the willingness of the governed to accept it. And I submit in testimony the Prohibition Act. If there ever was a law, and don't forget, it's just as sacrosanct as any law. It wasn't just enacted by Congress. It was a constitutional amendment, with, if you please. And don't forget... 
that the Lord used the Constitution to wipe the sweat from his brow just after he got through making Adam, according to what they teach you in the schools about the timelessness of the Constitution. It was a constitutional amendment. If there ever was a legal regulation of the ruling powers of this country that was honored more in the breach than it was in the observance, it was the prohibition law. All it succeeded in doing was making do-it-yourself distillers and brewers out of the population of the United States and put the professionals out of work. And I submit it as a testimony, and on the last analysis in the most fundamental sense, about the meaning of a law. A law is as effective or as ineffective as the capacity of those against whom it is aimed to refuse to knuckle under to its restrictive, anti-democratic provisions. And that goes for the Taft-Hartley and Landrum-Griffin law as well. I'll take the case of uh, the Landrum-Griffin law, the last one. Uh, what happened? So you had the polar opposite of what the situation requires from the point of view of union leadership. And, and it's, a, it's a fake and a fraud. It's a frame-up. It's a frame-up to say that a law like the Taft-Hartley law or a law like the Landrum-Griffin law can be imposed because labor is docile that it's getting middle class in its mentality, that it doesn't want to fight, that it's, it accepts the status quo before everything else. Those anti-labor laws are being imposed because of betrayal and leadership. And just let me cite one form of that betrayal. Uh, the Lanham Griffin law was preceded by the McClellan investigation. Remember they first investigated a few of the rackets and then they started after the real target, the labor movement. And the gizmo was that the minions of law and order in Congress were going to safeguard the democratic rights of the rank and file against abuses by the leadership whereupon they imposed a series of regulations that puts the big foot of the government that much the farther inside the door of the union movement and introduces a new element of direct codified governmental regulation of the internal affairs of unions. What did the union leadership do? Well, let's take a single example. When they took after the Teamsters, why did they take after the Teamsters? You know why they took after the Teamsters? Don't ever underestimate the consciousness of the most informed sections of the ruling class. They got their vanguard that thinks things out, tries to think them out, and they succeed in their own pragmatic way. They try to think things out as deeply, strategically, and tactically, and principally in terms of class struggle as we do as a revolutionary party. The only thing is they think from the point of view of the opposing class. Why did they pick the Teamsters Union? Well, Hoff is no paragon of virtue as a leader. Hoff is part of the union bureaucracy and full of the weaknesses, limitations, vices in terms of good labor leadership that is typical of the general run of the bureaucracy. But uh, he's, not, he's not a modern Al Capone in the, uh, in the uh, uh, labor movement. He's not a uh, John D. Rockefeller who was a king-size Al Capone, to stay in the <laughs> same category. They went after the Teamsters precisely because the Teamsters is the biggest and strongest union. That's how cocky the ruling class feels. How they, how they feel they've got the working class in their pocket because of this bureaucracy 
on top of the union that functions as their as their servants and as tyrants over the unions. By striking a blow at one of the biggest unions in one single strike, one stroke, they felt they could sow terror everywhere, and they succeeded. They succeeded. What happened when the attack come on the Teamsters? What did the uh, AFL-CIO do? Did they rally to the defense of the Teamsters Union, saying, all right, so if we got some trouble inside one of our unions, that's the affair of labor and government keep out of it? What did they do? They expelled the International Brotherhood Teamsters and the AFL-CIO. That's what they did. And that's just one single example of the practice going on all up and down the line on the part of the bureaucracy. That uh, is, they're, they're like a pack of wolves. Uh, you know, you know the peculiar habit. It's a natural thing of the wolves. I mean, no offense to wolves when I use the uh, when I when I use the comparison. A pack of wolves are chasing some uh, some prey, and one of them gets wounded, and the others will turn and eat the wounded one before they go on to the search. You've read story after story about about how somebody trying to escape the wolves saved himself by shooting one, and while they were eating him, they managed to climb a tree, and the wolf couldn't get the wolf couldn't get at him. This is, this is what the union bureaucrats are doing. Every, every, time, every time the capitalist government strikes a blow at one of the unions, they turn on them like a pack of wolves getting shut of an, of an injured member. The polar opposite of that time-honored slogan on which the labor movement of this country was built in class struggle, that an injury to one is an injury to all. And if labor has got problems, it's a family fight, and we don't want any damn capitalist or any damn political agent of the capitalist and government in here throwing his weight around in the house of labor. We'll take care of our own affairs. Their policy is the polar opposite of that. And something is happening right now that just caps the climax, the example. In the same situation. Off you know, got an eight-year rap in the Nashville trial. Got a five-year rap in the trial here. And there's a lot of evidence to show it's a frame-up and that it really is a vendetta on the part of the federal government. Out to get him at all hazards, not because Hoffa is a public enemy, as that would infer, but because they're determined to sow such terror throughout the ranks of the whole labor movement that nowhere would anybody feel. ...that nowhere would anybody feel the courage to step up and object at anything they do. The Teamsters have started now a rank-and-file defense movement. They hired a couple of public relations representatives they got the ear of a congressman, got a subcommittee set up in one of, the, one of the congressional committees that's supposed to make an investigation of charges of misconduct on the part of the Department of Justice in the Nashville trial, including an investigation into some very questionable things about this Fink Parton that all of a sudden got loose from some serious charges the government had against him that had him, had him uh, well set up to be on the way to the pokey. And he went in and turned on Hoffa, testified in behalf of the Department of Justice, and now he's a hero, doing well, respected citizen, clean record. Police blotter, never heard of the man. And a... A set of 30 charges have been set down by this movement and the attorneys they hired to work for them. It's a rank-and-file movement in the Teamsters, uh, raising all kinds of questions of questionable conduct of the Department of Justice in the Nashville trial. This committee sent a lobbyist down to the Democratic Party convention to campaign for, for action 
by the platform committee to call for a congressional investigation of the Department of Justice. And the bureaucrats of the AFL-CIO lobbied against the lobbyists of the rank-and-file members of the Teamsters. Now, you want to start talking about what's the problem with the laws, what's the problem with labor struggle today. Don't start by blaming the workers. Start at the source. This despicable bureaucracy that is of the same stripe as the bureaucracy that sat on top of the movement before the upsurge of the 30s and in times that are coming is going to get the same kind of treatment that that bureaucracy got and you're going to see a different labor movement anything else Hoffa was not a part of the uh, of the uh, detachment that I described tonight that was sent up in the spring of 1936 by Tobin. They were all from Chicago. Hoffa is a Detroit man. At the time of the over-the-road uh, development, Hoffa was a junior business agent in the in the Detroit local that has jurisdiction over the over-the-road drivers. A man by the name of Red O'Loughlin was the principal delegate from uh, Michigan to the over-the-road uh, uh, committee. Hoffa did come into Minneapolis as part of the goon squad that arrived in 1941, but we haven't come to that in our story. We're going to go into that tomorrow night. <coughs> any other questions? If there aren't any other questions, I'd like to announce that uh, tomorrow night at 7.30... Comrade Farrell will give the last in the series of talks. And after the talk at about 10 o'clock, we'll have a campaign party for DeBerry and Shaw with Farrell as guest. And you're all invited to come and bring as many friends as you can. <laughs>